what are we looking for? Are we looking for some kind of fame? Are we looking for applause? Are we looking for, you know, what, what are our true meaning? Or do we want all that? Is it appreciation? Or does it matter? And yet, it would be nice. Our biggest motivation is always, we want to see what's going to happen next. Right. And yet, it does feel like we're on a sacred hunt. Yeah. You know, and how do you... How to share? Yes, we're in a world that rhymes with the past and lives in the future, and uh, it was a lot like now. And yet, you know, and I'm trying to explain where we are. And part, you know, party of smarties, and, uh, and so where this started um, was with uh, the Ballet Russe of Picasso. So that was like the big bang of art for me. Mm. So the first two pieces I made that were seven screens. Uh, concentrated on two dances, the Rite of Spring and Afternoon of the Fawn. And why the Ballet Russe was so fabulous is it took all these great artists together. There's Picasso, Nijinsky, there's uh, these choreographers and, and these great composers, and they're all working together. Well, it took me all these many years in, now that we're on a new iteration, so you know, I never thought what that meant. And what it, I, I'm saying the new meaning of that is we want to now be performing the work. Mm -hmm, we want to mm -hmm. be working with other people. Mm -hmm, it's, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the collaboration, you know? Mm -hmm. We want to be working with Jake. Yes. Listen to how quick we sound with Jake playing. This is like the art. It's a really... Yeah, so we've, um, we're, we're... Smith would say... Smith, Smith talks in Cohen's. Yes. What he'll say is prepare, unprepare. Mm -hmm. uh, Kind of at the heart of improvisation, you can't improvise unless you've worked really hard. You can't yeah. let go until the work has been, you know, there's some mastery. You know, there's, there's no improv improvisation without the, the, the layer below it, mm -hmm. the scaffolding. The things that we're least good at and don't yes. want to do, yeah. uh, there is somebody that's kind of our boss. Yeah. Here we are, Frank the Smith. We're waiting for Smith. I said, more like waiting for Gino. Uh, but what is the practice? So what I'm saying is maybe there's these pop-up places mm -hmm. that people will come to to see us perform, put on this show, and that the work can show up. And also, I think what's really important to talk about, especially like looking at this jacket that you made, and we, we got this material out of the dump. I, dump, I dove in a bin at, at last chance and brought this material home. But er, all the art material that we're using uh, yeah. is found material. We use paint and sprays and we, get, uh, we use, use canvases, we use cardboard, we use rough material. My love is my staple gun. Yeah. Uh, so the crudeness, that's nowhere that I'm looking to become better, where I'm looking to become better. Better is not the word, but it more advanced, uh, evolved, is in the messaging. I want people to walk in this room and I want it to be clear to them and I want them to go through the looking glass with us yeah. in an easier way. And I'm imagining with the words and the images and the, and the music and they'll, they'll hear parts of the story. The story builds on itself. It doesn't become new. It just becomes, it, it deepens. So as you walk through a room, um, you'll hear about this world. And it won't quite make sense, but you'll see a bit of it on the carpet here and a bit of it there. And, and the characters come to life. The characters slowly build as you hear more of it. Yeah. You get a taste of what the what those these characters are, yeah. who they are, and, and what role they play in the whole big story. And we're learning in a, you know, they, they'll talk and reveal, and uh, so many of the Im images are rooted in, in dream life. One being um, in an ancient temple, uh, and I would have been, I would have been, you know, you know, I love the old texts, and I, I think what's, you know, Jungian-wise, archetypes go back to the, sure. the ancientest of days. And me, personally, I would have been one of the people uh, dancing around the golden calf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would have been there in the euphoric, debauched state, 
looking at this beautiful piece of art, this object in the firelight under the moonlight and dancing around it, and then God would have come down from the mountain and smote me. <laughs> and I would have been one of the smoted. <laughs> and uh, I had this vision of being in this ancient temple, um, probably somewhere Mediterranean. I think there's water on it. I think the temple's on the, the shore. There, it's room. There's no ceiling above. It had a red dirt floor. The music was very uh, Middle Eastern-y, like a, and the dance was this, it was men and women holding hands in this dance on this long line, doing this snaking dance. And it was like, oh, this is my people. This is my tribe. I belong somewhere. Uh, so that was pretty profound. And then I had this dance of being um, backstage at like a cabaret one night. And there's these, uh, there's the bunk beds. And everybody, you know, the art workers would sit by their beds. They'd wear white t-shirts and they'd have their little thongs by the thing and everything orderly and they were the they were the art workers and uh, uh, it was like you know it was like being in a, a guild mm. you know and it was nothing spectacular but the backstage of the house and, and then on stage these uh, you know the show went on and all the, there's the girls in costumes and it's a cabaret and people are in various states of dress and undress, there's this big slick of chocolate that people kind of skated through, which was kind of only, only in a dream. So I witnessed this place, okay, this theater, and then I came back to it in another dream later on once I, you know, once I knew much more about the Buddy and Bester, who were kind of contemporaries of Beryl Brecht and Charlie Chaplin could hold the conversation. So they took their art with that same level of of radical seriousness, and they were song and dance men. And I'm backstage again in my dream in this backstage cabaret, and Buddy and Bester are on stage, and we're watching from the wings. And all this bustle backstage stops, and everybody goes because Buddy and Bester are on, and they're doing their thing, and they talk with their feet, and you hear the tapping go on, and then the tapping gets louder. And then it gets louder, and then it's thundering, and you hear these feet faster and faster and faster and faster, and it's deafening, and you're backstage, everybody's backstage at the mouth and gate, watching Buddy and Bester, and it hits a crescendo, and then bam, it stops, in silence, and you know that you've seen mastery. And everybody's like, wow. So, you, you know, there's something, each of us, in our life, if you have a life of an artist, you've seen a, a great artist up close. If you've been, had, had that, been that lucky, mm -hmm. and I, I've seen a few up close, you know how how does this life force go through you? What is it all about? And it's all often people who, you know, they're not great people. They're sometimes rotten people, you know. Uh, and just talking about the, you, you know, so so the whole art thing is such a fabulous fascinating question of what matters, what is success, what does success look like? We were talking about jo Jackson Pollock uh, in, in this song, Jackson Pollock on the spree, Jackson Pollock in a tree. Well, Jackson Pollock died a young man in a miserable death, a drunk, bloated, uh, beyond hope, driving 100 miles an hour with two teenage girls in the car the height of irresponsibility. Drives off the road, lunges into a tree, kills one of the girls. He was thrown through the windshield. You know, what an inglorious end. Mm. Uh, and yeah, he gets to heaven and lucky he signed his sleeve because he had a pollock and he, everything was perfect in heaven. So his, his legend is perfect. So is that what success looks like? Mm. You know, so we ask, you know, mm. again, be careful what we pray for. Mm. So let's talk about the scene that cut, got cut out of uh, uh, the, the Price of Everything. So when, when Smitten was written out of history, 
uh, he'd been on the set with Stephen Edless. That was what that uh, conversation was about, was the fish mm -hmm. and, 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 and Smitten. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that conversation, Smitten told him, you know, he asked uh, kind of what his philosophy, you know, what he thought genius was, what, 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 what Smitten thought genius was. And Smitten brought up the, uh, the Madras shirt. So imagine you're a, imagine you're a young clothing designer and you go to India and you buy the coolest silk you can find and it's this mat and you go to the city of Madras and you buy their cloth madras and you spend all your dough but you're not smart enough to know that the cloth should have been uh, cured. Yeah. Yeah. So you get home and the cloth runs. So people wear it, it's cool, it's this cool mattress cloth. And everybody starts wearing the stuff until it starts fading and it immediately fades out. <laughs> and if you're smitten, what you do? You hire Bobby Zen, the movie star, Shahrazadi, movie star. You put them in the Madras shirts, you sell the fade, and the rest is history. So what we've learned from that is to really embrace our mistakes. You know, every, every mistake is an opportunity. And uh, I, I have to go back to it takes faith to do that. You, you know, you step into this world and give over to it and let it happen.